Yeah. Coming up next on Rugby Wrap-Up, Six Nations and ARC Talk with Alex Corbacero. Rugby Wrap-Up brought to you in part by Irish Rugby Tours, the Rugby Tours people. A balanced palate, nutrition for peak performance. And the Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street, the world's best rugby pub. Hey everybody, Matt McCarthy and Alex Corbacero at the Fantasy Sports Network Studio 34 in Midtown Manhattan talking rugby. But Alex, we are talking across the pond rugby. First, we're going to talk Six Nations and the ARCs. First of all, how are you? I'm great, mate. Great to be here. Feeling good. Obviously, tough loss for England on the weekend. but you know. did, they, did they lose? Yeah. They lost the match? Yeah. yeah. Wasn't the greatest. All right, but let's get to the notes. All right, we have a script to follow here, Alex. Oh, okay. sorry, sorry, sorry. So I'm going to get to your misery in a second. Ah. Uh, All right? So let's go over the scores first. Okay. Wales at home versus England. England. Do you know anything about England? A little bit. You played a little bit for a England? A little bit. Yeah. Three of my friends are there. Yeah. So. <laughs> so that was 21-13. Yeah. Right? Okay. We're just going to go over the scores right just now. Just the scores. Right. right. France. France. Les Bleus. Knocking off Scotland. Steve Lewis is Scotland. 27 to 10. Right? Okay. Then we've got Ireland. Not looking great. But credit Conor O'Shea in Italy. Right? 26-10 was the final. Italy had a lead. Yeah. Right? And, you know, it was a pretty pretty good effort. Yeah. And a team that you could have played for as well. Yes. Italy. Right? And Ireland. Yes. <laughs> we got both. Both teams. Yeah. We got to call that the Corbicero Derby. Right? Yeah. All right. Winner gets Corbicero. Uh, let's okay. Let's break them down a little bit. Wales, are they the best team in Europe right now? Not sure. I'm not sure. I think they are one of the best teams. I think really the test for me is now how they go on to Murrayfield is a is a big test for them, and then Ireland will gauge it because the first two games weren't that impressive from them. The comeback was impressive, but really, you know, that was France's imploding more than Wales's mastery in in my opinion in the first one. But the way they handled England is it was very impressive yeah. i think and the consistency of their win streak is very big they got a really good experienced squad um they have a good balance in their team and and i just thought they just outdid england in key areas of the game they they, they nullified england's kicking game they controlled the game and then they really they muscled them in the second half you know they went direct pick and go pick and go because england's line speed and the the defense was doing well but they were hampering themselves yeah. with, with with penalties and where it was giving wales ins to their into their half, their 22, and Wales just went pick and go, narrowed it up, kept the ball in play for a long time. And when you've done 20 odd phases, then all of a sudden now line speed's a lot harder to do, yeah. you know? And so, and so it was smart from Wales. And I thought, you know, real credit to them. That's a good England side that had played some great rugby that they kind of made in the second half look little one dimensional and, and, and average at times. Yeah. And, and, this was an England team that was on the front foot coming in. Yeah, yeah and, and I positives. thought England did a lot in the first half where I was still not too worried at half by half time. Like, you know, I thought my only worry is England haven't converted enough points for being sort of dominant at key areas of the game. And then Wales just turned it up a notch. Like I said, that right. that twenty eight phase area or thirty plus phases to score that try, that kind of Amazing. broke the back of England there. Yeah. It was just too long ball and play, physical, direct. Wasn't anything flash for a while. The forwards just muscled up. And then England kind of lost their way. They went too kick heavy, never really tired Wales out with their own long areas of phase. Like you got Manu, you got Billy, you got, you know, Sinclair, you got some good carriers. Use them, run them, yeah. run them, run em. put some holes in that Wales. Cause England were making all the tackles. Yeah. They were doing all the work. Yeah. Like, you know, and then they, they, the damn burst kind of for them first. Yeah. Almost. And yeah. then Wales came on. You have someone like bigger that really just took the ball by the horns yeah. in that game, started putting the balls up, catching them. Those, Key moments, those kick returns or the tap backs and Wales were getting the ball back on both ends. Those were just the, the difference maker for me that was swinging it sort of, you know, Wales' way. And then England yeah. were chasing the game plan instead of, I would have just gone more direct if I was England. Yeah. Once, once the game started to slip, I would have said, let's just get down, get, you know, even if we're in the middle area of the field. Complicated. Yeah, England, I, I had a game plan that they, I don't think they were going to play even within 50, you know, 45, 50. Where I, even if I was at the 45 mark, I would have tried to play more just to make Wales defend more because Wales only gave away two penalties. Crazy. Two penalties, which is incredible. 80 minutes of an international But when you're not match. defending for large parts yeah. of the game, it's a lot <laughs> easier to not give away pens. England gave away so many pens while defending, I felt that, you know, you got to, England's discipline's an issue, but also you got to look at that and say, 
we should just held on to the ball more and just made them work and, and seen what happened. Because then we went to kick So what you're thinking penalties. is perhaps there are fix fixable mistakes for England. I, I think so. But this is the other key thing for me is that England, what always worries me as someone who's been through the English system is fatigue. Is, is the fact that they play more, they're not managed well, and then it's the same thing as last Six Nations. I thought England looked pretty good in the first two games, not great, but pretty good, and then the damn burst in the third game. So Players are playing of, too much rugby. And I think then I think they get trained too hard in camp. Eddie flogs those boys. They have you know op, they had a fallow week, but you know they're getting killed in that week. Then they had London Irish in. I've heard someone told me that Georgia are coming in to train against them. If anything, I would say we need to rest. We need players that, you know, you've got to trust they're going to perform. You can't flog them to make sure they're at intensity. You've got to have belief in this side. Because look at Gatlin. He rested 10 players against Italy. Took the gamble. Took it. But what? It paid off. He, yeah. it, when when yeah. the chips were down and someone had to raise the intensity, who did it? The better rested team. And one could argue that he is literally managing this team for the World Cup. Yeah, rather than the Six Nations. And despite that, Still rolling in on the yeah. Grand Slam, yeah. yeah. And you'd, you'd argue either or, but it's smart as well that, you know, he gave 10 people opportunities because in the World Cup, you can't play the same team every game. Right. And and he took the risk Italy away. It could have gone wrong, a bit like Ireland could have gone wrong as well, but right. it didn't. They got enough done. And look where they are. They just, you know, knocked off England, which is massive. Right. And that was just galvanize Wales on a hold. You see how emotional that crowd was. Yeah. Like, you know, it almost <laughs> makes you want to be Wales for a little yeah, bit, like yeah. just to enjoy that feeling. You know, there's, there's no one as England when yeah. you play, maybe other than the All Blacks, right. where you're really like, oh, it's so good to beat, you know. Right. But even then, there's right. more just because it's, they're that good. It's more to beat England than I think Everyone the All Blacks. Isn't it England. Wales? Would they want to beat? Would a Welshman on the street nah, want to beat England? England more than yeah. the All Blacks. I think they would have been, ha I think they'll be happy. <laughs> Even if they don't win the competition, they still have a good taste in their mouth because they smashed England at. In Absolutely. Cardiff, yeah. and, and, you know, getting back to what you said, you were worried about the match. I was watching the match at the Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street, and it was it was a great environment. Yeah. And it was after the, the uh, Scotland match with France. Yeah. But fans were worried. All in the in the bar. English fans were worried, and then everybody that wasn't English was worried that Wales was going to blow it. Yeah, <laughs> so true. But this is another thing that I played for. England. Look at the Irish staff. It's like, know. oh, they're gonna blow it. They're gonna blow it. They're gonna blow it. I'm like, we just, we, everybody, relax here. Nobody is enjoying this match. The thing is, yeah, I know. Everyone loves to beat England. Yeah, you, historically. But then everybody across the board on both sides of the aisle were worried about losing the match yeah, i'm like how about enjoying the match yeah it's too tense that yeah, game because it, it was so tense because other than those two moments of where scored it was still really like when Wales scored it was still really like chess back and forth yeah. arm wrestle of a game you just couldn't be certain like no one had <laughs> exerted a lot of dominance until Wales in that last period so i kind of get why you're nervous i was nervous yeah all right speaking of dominance France, 27-10 over Scotland with like 75 tries disallowed. Yeah, I know. For the Scottish luck. Honestly. Right? Uh, but was this, uh, uh, was this a statement that the French are actually developing young players? Well, I, I would have said that, if you'd asked me, I said one, if you saw their under-20 team win the World Cup last year, you would have said that they've – they found their mojo of how to develop players. I think there'd been a big issue with, with them. the pro with the top four team. Yeah, roaming. exactly. There'd been a big issue for them for a long time of getting their players through. But whatever they've changed at Marcuse and the system they've done, like you, that twenties team already makes me have hope for them that in the next couple of years it's an upward curve just yeah. because of the amount of players. Like to have a nineteen-year-old at ten that could control a game at the Six Nations, you're in a good place when you got one of those two of those coming through. You know, well, one could argue. And one could argue specifically if they watched the match with a Scotsman named Steve Lewis watching his team lose, that is this really a, a statement game for France that they are developing young players or did they beat an undermanned Scotland team without seven of their starters and three of their, they're only three world-class players. Yeah. You, you, so which, which Well, look it? at them the week before. So look at France the week before. They got or the game before, I should say. It was two weeks before. They got slaughtered. They got slaughtered. It was embarrassing. They came out there, and they could have scored 40 or 50 on that team. They right. got away 27 or whatever, but what I liked about them was just the balance. But you're, but you're, comparing, you're comparing... Yeah, but Scotland... Like, be, what, how, you can't hold it against France that Scotland has no depth in their player pool. Right. You know, that's not France's problem. Right. Like, if anything, I'll wait to the next game and see if they're proved wrong by that game now more than say, oh, well, I don't want to be a sapper and say, well, 
You know, it's not a true Scotland because they're missing all these players. It's a team that turned up like France can't control who gets injured for Scotland. Right. And so for and me, they did play the younger players. Yeah, and they played the younger players, but they also had a balance. They brought like Bastaro back. Like they they kind of mixed it up, and their pack looked good. They just had a good balance to their team. They looked a little lost before. Like when when you watch France the last couple of games, once it went through the phases a bunch, unless they were just picking, going, keeping it tight, and then looking to just play when it you didn't really see anything from them. I couldn't see a pattern or how they're trying to play or what their definitive shape is or what their go-to like default is when whatever it was, it was real all over the place where that game, they seem to have just more structure and they're a bit more clinical at times, but they just had that more balance to their game. Which and they were that, exciting. Yeah. And that was the thing that was flair, missing for me. Flair. And then their pack fronted up too. Yeah, their pack yeah. fronted up. Like, yeah. and they, it was a good balance to their game, which I think that balance for me had been missing. So that's why I'm more optimistic from that result than, Maybe a Scotsman would be. But also, Scotland, don't care if you're on your seventh players. Just handling errors and incompletions are just killing themselves. Yeah. You know, that's two games where they would have been completely different games if they could hold on to the ball. So let me ask you this. Playing in Paris. Yeah. Do those horns bother you as a player in the band and all that stuff? Do you hear that while you're playing? I didn't really bother me. There's a track there, isn't there? Yeah. And so you're a little bit further right. away than, say, Twickenham or something anyway from the True. crowd. So it never really affected me. I think Rome and Paris are the two that have that little track around. And it kind of... Kind of a buzzkill, that Yeah. I, I don't agree. For the, for yeah, the, for the yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I always found it a little bit easier to drone out when you've got that track around kind of separating you. Like, Paris was intense, but... It, that, it's a little bit of breathing space. What about in some of the other French uh, cities? Did the the, the 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 horns and stuff? Yeah, bother you? a little bit. I, when I played in um, my under twenties, six. Where did we play? Grenoble. It was like the opening game of the stadium, and yeah. they packed it, and they yeah. all had the. And that I was like, as a young, it's we a, were like, wow, yeah. So as if I'm say, if I pay to go to those matches, and I don't know this ahead of time, and I'm sitting there, and there's a guy with a horn next to me the whole game, I'm yeah, gonna, I'm gonna go nuts. It's a little antisocial. I'm yeah. not gonna lie. Yeah, but you know, it's very French. <laughs> but but rugby is uh, social, very très social, right? Yeah. yeah. So look it up. Anyway, uh, should Ireland be alarmed after a little bit only beating? Italy 26-10, losing to England, not looking in great form, or are they just like, okay, we know what we have to do when the chips are down to win the big ones. We're looking at the World Cup as the big one. Are they playing like maybe Warren Gatlin is, is Joe Schmidt doing that? Or should, should Ireland fans I don't concerned? think they should be like alarm bells ringing, but they should be a little bit worried that this is definitely a dip in the progression and the form we've seen Ireland. There's key areas to me where I think I'd say what's going on. Um, you know, Sexton and Murray aren't clicking as they have been his best. I don't think we've just seen the best Connor Murray. I think Sexton came in cold to the Six Nations, like hadn't played in Europe, injured, came in, and he's been good, but he hasn't been world player of the year good. Yeah. Connor Murray had that long period out with a neck injury. Those two have only played together a little bit. They're just not taking charge of the game in the same way, but a lot of that to me is coming down to their ball carriers. Okay. You know, you know, Sean O'Brien's been very quiet. You know, they haven't really been getting on the front foot. You know, they don't have a, an eight. Their second row, like, no one's been well, carrying. They just, they've had injuries in the second row. Yeah. They're openly trying to push Rory best. Yeah. You know, with Cronin. Yeah. Right? And he didn't really have a No, and then, like, match. you look at that game. Like, you couldn't, like, you can't win games without hitting lineouts. Right. Like, it's similar to Rooney, we said. Like, you right. lose a bunch of lineouts, and it's just impacts your game so much. And, and it's just, you know, especially at the top level. But for me... They're easily fixable things, but because they're a team the guys beat, getting healthy. They're, yeah, they're a team that beat the All Blacks in in the autumn, like convincingly yes. shut them down. Do, they I have a game plan that works, that. but England out muscled Ireland, and and I think when Wales and Ireland play, that's for me the big test is those game line collisions decide the game for me. Yeah. Like there's obviously other like like other areas, but Ireland need to be getting on the front foot again because they're too easy to def like England just nullified them, yes. nullified them, and then they just didn't really click against and part of that you could say a few changes and stuff but for me they they need to turn the dial on now alex getting the note from uh, off camera that we are out of time right now we have to break for commercial so we're going to come back and talk six nations on this side of the pond the america's rugby championship we'll be right back if you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig & Whistle on West 36th Street. Hey, we're back. Matt McCarthy and Alex Corbacero at the Fantasy Sports Network Studio 34. Alex, we had talked Six Nations on your original side of the pond in, in Europe, but now we're talking on this side, the America's Rugby Championship. 
Team USA avoided an unmitigated disaster in outlasting Brazil. Yeah. That's, that's how we could categorize that one, sort of. Was a little nervous yeah. at the end there. The sort of momentum had shift. Uh, the scrum, easy inroad, you know, it just it puts pressure on you. If you if you break someone at the scrum consistently around the field, it's just easy entries into your easy ways to exit pressure from your own half, easy ways to enter their half, and it makes playing a lot easier. You don't have to play all those phases to get down there. And USA were on the ropes for for periods of it, and they probably just should have been a little bit smarter in game. Yeah. Like it, 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 I would like to think if they could rerun that game, they'd win by 20 or 30 by yeah. learning the lessons. But man, it was closer than it ever should have been. Yeah, and and coming off of the ego bruising yeah. beating that they, they took in Argentina. Argentina. Yeah, that's what I was expecting. Back on home soil, the bounce back from that, a big response. But there are... Is there something in the air for a team playing at home in Austin? Maybe there is, mate. Maybe it's the changing <laughs> yeah. room. There's some yeah. sort of curse on that yeah. home changing room. Yeah, and they switch the changing rooms. Exactly. Right? exactly. Don't tell anybody. Um, yeah, just, just do them. something. Interesting. All right, and now they're playing Uruguay, who is coming loaded for bear. They've got nine players, according to America's Rugby News, ARN, our friends up north. Uh, they've got nine major league uh, rugby players coming in. They've also got Franco Lamana coming back. So they're going to be ready to play. They they want this because this is, you know, impacting the world rugby rankings, the yep. World Cup, all that stuff. Uruguay, should we be afraid of Uruguay? Yeah, I think you have to be, you know, fearful or wary of them. It's it's an easy banana skin at home. Uh, I don't take any game for granted in this ARC. I think the Eagles haven't quite shown the form that I was hoping they would show. So this is an opportunity to go out there and you know, put it right. Yeah. But it's it's not an it's not a foregone conclusion the Eagles should win these games. You know, Uruguay will go out of play. They they have a good team. They have, a, they have a good balance to their team. They know how to play the game. It's not like a rugby IQ shy nation as such. So you have to respect teams like that. And they're physical. And I think if we have to make sure it's source, especially in the pack in certain areas, right. we get that right. Because right. then it allows us to play. It allows us to play. When we when we have sort of little areas where we don't quite click, it really it can really hurt you. Yeah, and what what will help them? Uh, this is at Starfire up in yeah. Seattle, and those fans are probably going to come out in droves and just be screaming for the Eagles. So that's going to be a lift. That'll be That'll a little be bit big. different than Austin. That'll be big, and and I, and I think USA will right the wrongs. Like yeah. I, I think you know there'll be some lessons to learn from there. There'll be guys you know that will be frustrated. The coaches probably will be as well. And is this things that can easily be put right? Uh, is it Teo? Mike, I liked Mikey him Teo, on the yeah. wing. I thought he, you know, it was good to have him out there. So, little, it's just X yeah. factor. I think yeah. sometimes in those games, a little X factor spice. Um, the CK looked real like physical as always. Like we, we we have our inroads into the game. We just need the platform, the field position, and just not to give a team like a scrum disintegrated. And that's just an avenue for a team to to come back into a game. You, you tighten up those areas and. You know, USA probably see that game out pretty comfortably. Yeah, I'm with you on that one, and and that's that would be a relief for everybody in in USA camp. Yeah, that's a win that that would, that would be a nice win to get the the uh, confidence back. Definitely, Canada demolished Chile. Yeah, finally having a a good match. They've been struggling. Yep. Right, but now they're up against it. Argentina 15s. So that's you know, despite the fact that it's arguably a third side. I know there are people out there that say it's not an Argentinian third side because they say the First side or is playing over in super whatever. Yeah. It's a third side, right? Pretty much. You know, you got the two and a half side. Pumas, Jaguars. I say two and a half sides. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but yeah. it's not a cap test match. No. Right? So they are still a formidable team. So Canada is in rough shape. This will be a big test for Canada. Huge test for them. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, you know, they'd be a good test of where they are. And then obviously, them in USA meeting is probably the, the real exciting one as well. And then you got a team that we talked about, Brazil, who's now on the front foot. They have to be, you know, emboldened by that win, that the loss against the Eagles. Yeah, right. And they're playing Chile. Yeah. So I think I favor Brazil. In that I game. think so. The Battle of South America. I think. Yeah. Brazil is going to win that. I think one. they just maul them up front as well. Like, Anything that uh, excites you out of the uh, the ARCs so far? Any player on your that you've said, "Wow, I didn't know about him." Anything like that? I wouldn't say anyone I didn't know because I, from I'm gonna look from an American point of view probably the most. There was no one I didn't know. I, I I've liked Fawcett at Hooker to yeah. get actually see him get some reps and the yeah. team has been good. Um, yeah. It's a good problem I that Gary Gold's got. Yeah, at Hooker. exactly. Like Joe T and Joe T and, 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 and Dylan Fawcett. And you can't play a World Cup with just one Hooker, you know. So having like finding that backup, I think, has been big for them. Um, 
I liked Teo on the wing. I think that's a good addition for us. Good to see him back from injury. And he's playing well. It just looks sharp. Like he's a threat. Yeah. Um, I just want to see a little bit more playmaking balance. You know, whenever they put the, whoever's at 15, I, I think before when you had, if you got more power based centers, I think sometimes you just need to, sometimes that 15 position has to be our second playmaker. And I think that will just open a lot of things up for us. But back to a question of anyone in particular, probably not anyone other than what I'm thinking. Hanko's played well as well. Yeah. He's carried very well. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, my friend, I could talk rugby with you all day. Definitely. And, and we'll continue this at the pub. Yep. All right. On behalf of Mr. Alex Corbusero, stepping in for the Lizard, Steve Lewis, I'm Matt McCarthy for Rugby Wrap-Up, talking rugby in Midtown Manhattan at Studio 34, signing off.